Okay, so in this particular video, we're going to walk you through chapter 12. Now, in the previous video, we already went through most of these terms, and then we talked through Mendel's, um, we didn't specifically talk about his experiment, but I am um, kind of relying on that this has been covered in high school. If not, definitely go back and read through this, but it's mainly what I've already talked through, and that is your monohybrid and your dihybrid. What do you mean? Remember we talked about how we can arrive at three to one and one to two to one with the monohybrid? That was actually the very experiment um, that Men uh, Graham Mandel did to figure out that your gene is actually, every gene is dictated by two allele. And that is his conclusion and kind of led to um, the main hypothesis, which is um, the first law. Okay, not hypothesis, his first law, which is the principle of segregation. And that talked about how allele of same gene behave. So if you recall, that's what we did with our um, monohybrid, which means we have mono, one trait, hybrid, two different heterozygous. And then we cross them and we say, how do they behave? They separate. Remember that? Okay. So um, one of the things that Gregor Mendel figured out is that um, every gene has two alleles. It's dictated by two separate allele. And during meiosis, they same gene segregate during the gamete formation. So that is the key. And then moving on, then we um, went on and start talking about the second hypo um, law, which is the law of independent assortment. What is this law mainly talking about? It's how the allele from different gene behave. So, dihybrid cross or the principle of independent assortment. This is when we talked about, well, what if you have two traits, right? This is gene A, this is gene B. They are allele of different gene. This is one gene, A gene. This is B gene. And big A, small a are allele from gene one. Big B, small b is allele from gene two. How do they behave? Oh, they sort independently. So if I get big A, doesn't always mean I get big B or small b. I got equal chance. Remember this? So when you make gametes, the allele of different gene assort independently into gametes. Okay. So these are the main take home. And to really drive this home, then we did the dihybrid. Remember big A, small A, big B, small B, cross with big A, small A, big B, small B. And that's when we resulted in the dihybrid cross, which looked like this, okay? And that's how we ended up with the nine to three to three to one. So this is kind of reviewing the various different components that was already covered. So today I'm gonna start actually in um, this slide, slide 25. So what is test cross, okay? This is specifically a way for scientists to actually get at, okay, let me kind of go back. Yeah, how do I go back? Previous slide, previous slide, previous slide. Okay, test cross. This is a way that um, actually you can figure out the genotype to determine the genotype of an individual with a dominant phenotype. What does that mean? Okay, if your phenotype is dominant, so let's say you are tall. Well, what can your genotype be? From the past, we said you can be homozygous or heterozygous. Remember that? So how do I know? I can only look at your observable trait. You're tall. I can't see your gene. So one way of doing this is what's called a test cross. What do you do? You cross the tall plant, okay, with, so you cross the un, 
individual which has dominant phenotype with a individual that has the recessive phenotype, which is short. What does this mean? This means if I am if I am tall and I am homozygous, then this is my cross. If I am tall and I am heterozygous, then this is my cross. Okay, and you're like, and? Well, let's look at their offspring. Tall, I can only give big T. Small, short, I can only give little T. So all my offspring will be heterozygous, tall. So if you cross a dominant phenotype individual that you don't know, unknown genotype, with a recessive, which is short, and all your offsprings are the dominant phenotype, which means tall, then what do you think its genotype is? Yes, if you have all tall offspring, then you are homozygous, right? You're homozygous tall or homozygous dominant. Now let's look at what if you're heterozygous. Okay, I'm gonna change your color so it's more clear. Well, let's look at this. You either have this as your gametes or this. So let's do the cross, big T or little t. With what kind of gametes does this produce? Only little t. So let me cross. Huh, I get tall and I get short and they're one to one. Do you see that? So if you got one to one, tall to short, then what does that tell you about your parent? Then the parent must be heterozygous, tall. So this is what test cross is. It is, you don't know, dominant phenotype unknown right here. It's either homozygous or heterozygous. So you cross it homozygous, you cross the dominant form with the recessive, and you look at its offspring. Oh, it's all dominant. In this case, it's all purple. Ha, huh. then you must be homozygous. But what about this? Dominant, recessive, you got dominant and you got recessive. Then this guy must be heterozygous. Okay, so that is what test cross is. It's to determine the genotype, the unknown genotype of the dominant phenotypic organism. Okay, moving away from all of that, let's talk about, well, how does this affect us? Well, actually by knowing how genes work, this really help us hone in and understand how human traits are being inherited. So, um, human traits are controlled by, some human traits are controlled by single gene, okay? Not all, some. And so for these traits that are controlled just by one gene, we can easily track it using something called the pedigree. And I'm going to talk more about what pedigree is. And there's an analysis called the pedigree analysis. Okay. And I'm going to show you a dominant pedigree of glaucoma. This is a disease that actually causes degeneration of the optic nerve and can lead to um, blindness. Now, this juvenile glaucoma gene is actually dominant. That means you just need one, and then now you have glaucoma, okay? You just need one of it to, to get glaucoma, okay? And there are various traits in human, okay, that are determined by either dominant or recessive, that's well known in human. So you see people that doesn't have any black pigments that, that has albine, um, that, are, that has albinism. These are recessive traits, okay? And so is color blindness, that's a recessive trait. Cystic fibrosis, recessive. Hemophilia, that means you cannot stop blood from, um, 
you cannot stop blood from flowing, that you have inability to, for the blood to clot. Okay, and another recessive trait is sickle cell anemia. So all these traits, you need both allele to be affected. Okay, you need cystic fibrosis. So let's say you need both to be affected. So the chances are both your parents already carry it. Okay, so let's look at how this type of um, traits can be inherited or figured out in human. If it's dominant, like the glaucoma, okay, then you can build something called a pedigree like this. So now let's first decipher what is a pedigree and how do we read it. A pedigree is a way that um, geneticists can actually map out and follow the trait. In this case, any shape that is colored are individual that are affected. So in this case, this is affected, this is affected. If you're not shaded, then you're unaffected. And the shape square means male. Okay, so I'm gonna use square. And female is depicted by a circle. So in this case, who is affected? this person. So in the first generation, dad was affected. Here is dad affected. Mom was fine. So dad probably have glaucoma. And then they got married. That's what the horizontal means and had kids. So this dictates when you have a vertical line, that means that's the next generation. And these are offspring from the two. Okay, so if you have a horizontal line between two shapes, that means they marry, they cross, and then they had offspring that then was depicted by a vertical line going down. So dad and mom married and had how many children? One, two, three, three children. And they are two boys and one girl. Dad is affected, so is one of the boy. And one of the girl. The boy and the girl each got married to their spouse who are not affected and resulted, but resulted in kids that are all affected. This is the effect of a dominant gene. You just need one. And unfortunately, all the kids got that one allele and was affected. Okay. So this, this then allows geneticists to then track and understand um, how this particular um, trait actually work. Because the fact that all three children got it, we can track back and actually figure out this most likely is a dominant gene because both individual spouse doesn't have it, but the kids still got it. So in the future, in the worksheet, we're going to try and map out the genotype of these individuals, okay? And we'll talk more about it during the problem-solving part. For this part, you mainly need to know how to read a pedigree. What does the shape mean? What does shaded mean? And how do I look at a pedigree and say, hey, that's dominant? Usually when you get affected individual in every generation, that means it's a dominant gene. Now let's look at another example, which is a recessive gene. Okay, so let's continue. Now, an example of recessive gene is albinism. Albinism is a condition which pigment mel melanin is not produced. So these people have white hair and their eyes appear red, uh, mainly because they have inability to actually deposit pigment onto their hair and various um, structures. But this is recessive. That means you need homozygous recessive alleles to actually get this particular um, phenotype. Okay, so let's look at what we got here. Now, in this particular um, example, let's first look at the slide. The unshaded are not affected, 
right? So granddaddy, grandmommy doesn't have it. Daddy and mommy doesn't have it. Generation three. But all of a sudden, it appears in the third generation. So we see a pedigree that skips generation. Usually these kind of phenotype means the gene is recessive. That's why it can skip generation. It can hide and then reappear. Okay, so what really is happening? Let's see. Go back. What's really happening is this. So in this particular picture, we are actually depicting out the actual genotype. So most likely one of the parents, let's just take daddy, for example, carries the gene. But is he showing it? No, because when you have albinism, which is recessive, you have heterozygous that isn't shown because what is affected is actually homozygous. So without both little a, you don't show it, yet you carry it. And so the daddy doesn't really have albinism, but he has one allele that has that recessive trait. So he passed it on to several of his offspring. So in this case, most likely mommy is fine. And daddy gave the little a, mommy get the big a. And so these second generation still have no albinism, but is carrying the gene. Now coming into generation three, this is when you see it. Most likely this person gave little a, and this individual gave little a. Aha, now you have a homozygous, and this is an affected individual. So is this one. This one doesn't show, this one doesn't show, but somehow, two individual that doesn't have albinism ended up with a offspring that has it. And guess what? Usually when you have lines that are double line, that means you got mating between first cousin. This is why it's prohibited to marry your cousin because a lot of your recessive traits that isn't shown can show up. So let's look back. Actually look forward. So if you look at this, they are not showing it. They don't have albinism, yet they have kids that have albinism. That definitively says this is recessive because if it was dominant, then this individual must have carried that dominant gene to give it to the son. Then she should show it, but she doesn't. So with parents that are not showing it, but offspring showing it, then this particular trait has to be recessive, okay? So again, this part of the um, lecture, mainly you need to know how to read a uh, pedigree. You need to know what shade it means, you need to know what shapes means, and you need to know eventually how to draw out this type of pedigree. If I were to give you a story, like mom and dad who are not affected individual have birth to three individual, one boy and two girls. There you go, one boy, square, two girls. The boy was a, was affected, then you color it, and went on to marry a girl that wasn't affected and had five kids. You know, this is, so, so then you need to be able to trace this. After this, then we can start explaining how to use this to eventually arrive at answering some cool questions like, well, what is the genotype of this individual and what is the likelihood of this individual actually having a kid that's also affected, okay? So that's the major take away from this part of um, the lecture. And we'll do some uh, problem sets to practice that later on in another video. Let's move on with the lecture onto some other concepts. So Mandel mainly worked on one gene, one trait. That means one gene controls one trait. One gene controls how tall you are or how tall the pea plant is. One gene controls the color of a pea plant. But reality is in human, there are exceptions, okay? 
So we need to talk about extensions to the Mendel model. In his model, each trait is controlled by a single gene, and each gene only have two alleles, big A, small a, that's it. You only have two options, okay? And there is a clear dominant and recessive relationship, but that's not most of our genes. So we need to know the exceptions. One exception is called polygenic. What is that? That means you got multiple genes. Polygenic inheritance means multiple genes are involved in controlling one trait. So instead of one gene controlling one trait, you actually have gene A, A gene, B gene, C gene, all compute to eventually arrive at one trait. So this, this makes the prediction of a certain trait more, much more complex. It's not just, oh, you got the big T, you're gonna be tall. It's more, oh, there are several factors indeed, several genes that actually come together to determine your trait, okay? For example, our height. We're not like peas. There's more than one gene that dictates our height. And that is a polygenic inheritance. So let's look at this. So for us, in the whole human race, it's usually a normal distribution because um, there's actually multiple genes. And so we're not just tall. Everybody is a certain um, height and or <laughs> most people are another height. Okay, there are variations. That's what polygenic means. So there are variation in the trait. It's not just either or. Another exception is called pleiotropy. What pleiotropy is instead of one gene, one trait, and instead of many genes to one trait, which is polygenic. Now we're talking about, you got one gene that has multiple traits. Got trait one, trait two. That's called pleiotropy. So you have, when you have one allele and allele that has more than one effect on the phenotype, okay? And an example will be cystic fibrosis or sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia really isn't just the fact that it cannot stop the blood clot. There's multiple symptoms, so is cystic fibrosis, but the cause is actually just one gene, okay? This is called pleiotropy. So review. In the basic Mendel law, you're talking about one gene, one trait. In polygenic, you're talking about many gene that culminates to result in one trait. In pleiotropy, you're talking about one gene causing multiple traits. Okay. Okay. Let's move on. Now, there are another kind of exceptions, and this has to do with the dominant, okay? That not all trait that appears, again, is either or. You're either tall or you're short. There are actually something called incomplete dominance, and this is seen in the color of flowers, that you got one kind that's red flower, one kind that's white flower, but when you have something that is heterozygous, it's not, it doesn't result in red. So big R, big R is red. Small R, small R is white. And usually you said them big R, small R should be red. But how this particular gene works actually is incomplete dominance. So you have a little bit of red and a little bit of white and you actually result in pink. 
So that is one exception that heterozygous actually results in the intermediate phenotype, okay? Another exception is called codominance. This one is interesting, and we will have quite a bit of problem solving um, on this one, okay? This is saying that the two actually both have a say in the final phenotype. And an example is your blood type. So you got A blood type, you got B blood type, and what if you got one allele from the A and one allele from the B? Are you A or B? Actually, you are AB. So we'll talk much more of this very soon, okay? And what this is called. So this is the example of the incomplete dominance that I am neither red or white, I'm actually pink, okay? And this is easy kind of from the, um, the original monohybrid, right? You got heterozygous, heterozygous, and then you get the homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, and you got the heterozygous, which are one to two to one. So you got red that are one part, white that are one part, and you got pink that are two parts. So you, this is easily figured out using monohybrid cross. Okay, now let's get to the fun part on the ABO blood type um, genes. So the codominance of AB genes actually resides in the fact that your blood type is determined by multiple alleles. So let's review what alleles mean. Allele is different flavor of a gene. And in the past, I only introduced two flavors. So you're either big A or small A. You're either big B or small B, that's it. So you only have two alleles per gene. But the truth is a lot of gene have many different types of allele in the population, okay? And it just so happened that for blood type, there's multiple allele. So I'm gonna introduce the alleles, okay? The first one, we call it IA. The second one, we call it IB. The third one, we call it little i. The fact that you see big IA, big IB, means these two are dominant. And little i is the recessive one. Now let's map the genotype to the phenotype. When you have big IA, big IA, what do you think your blood type is? That's right, your A blood type. So this is genotype, this is phenotype. But guess what? You can also be big IA and little i, and you're still A blood type, okay? Same thing for B. You can be homozygous or you can be heterozygous. Now, the fun part comes when we have one big A and one big B. What do you think this is? So somehow daddy give you the big IA, mommy give you the big IB. Yes, this is actually AB blood type. So what do you think O blood type genotype would be? homozygous little i, okay? So this is called multiple allele because you got more than one allele dictating and it has the um, interesting characteristic of codominance because when you got two dominant allele, your phenotype is both A and B, okay? So Multiple allele is you got more than two allele for a gene. Here for blood type, we got three. So ABO blood type in human has three, but each individual can only have two. And so from those two dictates your phenotype, okay? Now, let's move a little bit further and talk about how this all works out. So we already, 
we already introduced the concept of multiple allele that you got three allele and codominance that when you have IA and IB, then you get both the trait of A blood type and B blood type. So what is at the basis of this? These are genotype. If you have big IA, big IA, little i, then this is your phenotype, your A blood type. Big IB, big IB, big IB, little i, your B. Okay, so we already explained this. Now, let me tell you kind of um, the, the basis of this. So what this is, is on your red blood cells, there is an antigen. And if you have the A blood type antigen, okay, then you are A blood type. If you have the B blood type antigen, then you are B blood type. Now, if your gene happen to make enzyme that puts on A blood, A antigen and B antigen, so just imagine one of this is a gene that puts a A hat on your red blood cell. When you have the IB gene, you put B hats on your red blood cell. Now, if you have both IA and IB, then you got two enzymes putting both A hats and B hats on your red blood cell. What about little i, little i? Well, they don't put anything. So your red blood cell doesn't have A antigen or B antigens, okay? So these are what we're referring to. So galactosamine and galactose are the different kind of um, antigen being added onto your red blood cells. If you have both genes, then you add both. When you have little i, little i, you don't add anything. Now let's think through what happens when you donate and receive blood? Well, if you're A blood type, that means your body recognizes this. It recognizes red blood cell that has A hats. If you're B blood type, your body recognizes B hats. If you're AB blood type, you recognize both. If you're O, you don't recognize any red blood cells with hats. So what happens? That means can can let's try this okay can a blood type donate to o well what happens let's put it here wow this individual is going to go nuts because its surveillance system its immune system has never seen this so it's going to attack it okay which is not good so a blood type cannot donate to O, but can O donate to A? Yes, if I put a red blood cell here, it's fine. I've seen red blood cells before. Can B donate to O? No, same thing. If you have a blood cell with B, this individual has never seen it, it's gonna attack it. But can O donate to B? Yes. Can O donate to AB? Yes, because they've all seen red blood cells before, but nobody can donate to O. That's why O is considered universal donor, can only receive from O, because I can donate to anybody, but I cannot receive any of this. What about AB? AB is considered universal receiver. Anybody can give to AB because, hey, I have a B, sure, I've seen B before. Hey, I have an A, sure, I've seen A before. So AB is considered a universal receiver and it can only donate to people with AB. Now B blood type can receive both B and O and can only donate to people with B or people with AB. Does that make sense now? So that kind of explains how blood transfusion works and why certain blood type can donate to certain blood type while others can't. So this lecture series kind of concludes the basis to understand how to assign um, multiple allele gene problem sets for blood type. 
and it goes through what codominance means. And then we also talk through very ex exceptions to Mendel genetics. And last, we also talk through how to build um, your pedigree. We're going to use all these knowledge and start doing a lot of problem sets moving forward. And that's the best way to utilize most of the understanding that you've got from um, this video. Okay, so um, we'll move on to more problem practice in the next video.